Well, hello there, motherfuckers, and welcome to your Survivor Series review. So, I guess I'll give you the pre-show matches as an added bonus, because I did watch them. I was in a Survivor Series mood. I don't know, there's sometimes when I turn on the show, and I know the product is, is pretty shitty, but there's times more than others that... that I want to watch grown men roll around on a canvas, you know, more times than others. So we had Matt Hardy and Elias Sampson. Sampson beat him with the drift away. He, like, beat the shit out of Matt Hardy. Um, they had him work over the arm. Uh, you know, if they were consistent like this with Elias, you know, maybe his character would be in other places now. You know, as it pertains to the show, but, you know, I like Elias. I look at the guy, and he looks like a cross between Seth Rollins if he was actually a tough guy and uh, Macho Man Randy Savage. The guy knows how to talk. He knows how to get heat. Uh, it's just up to fucking creative to do something with him. Uh, then you had uh, Enzo defeating Kalisto to retain his... Uh, his cruiserweight championship. You know, I look at this and I'm like, Kalisto and Enzo. These are two guys that are polar opposites. The Marks like Kalisto or they kind of like him. I don't even hear any of a reception for him. I mean, I hear some people in the crowd doing lucha, lucha, and other people are just sitting on their hands. Enzo is coming out there. He's cutting this massive promo. You know, he, um, he's showing how he's a master of the mic. And, you know, every single time Kalisto gets on the mic, he sounds, you know, like a scared child. So, you know, that doesn't really bode well for him. But I guess it bodes better for him in the current landscape where you could be a fuckboy baller. You could be looking down at notes on the floor and talking like this. And, and you know... WWE will still put you in a prominent position. Think about that. You know, that, that that's what it means. You, you don't even need to know how to talk nowadays. It's an added bonus, but it's it's not going to get you as far as it did. Pretty sad. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn defeated Breeze Dongo. Uh, you know, they, they, the last pay-per-view that SmackDown has, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are you know pull you know are uh, doing this whole thing to the to, to the SmackDown commissioner, you know Sami Zayn pulls Kevin Owens out of the way of, of Shane McMahon's elbow from the top of the cage, and somehow you know they cut a promo addressing this. They're relegated to the pre-show, and that's exactly the words that Sami Zayn used. This was a pretty decent promo, I will say. I, I um you know. Once again, Sami Zayn managed to cut a pretty decent promo. And it's been on and off again with this guy. One week his promo's not good. One week his promo is good. I don't know if it's his delivery or it's creative. I think it's delivery. It's not like the material is so exceptional. But I noticed that Sami Zayn, it, it might be a bit of overacting. But sometimes he gets into it, you notice he tries to talk with his hands and make facial expressions, and I will give him credit for trying. Think about how talking with your hands and making facial expressions is an improvement of looking down at the fucking floor at fucking notes. Oh, so these guys are not even featured on the show, and they were featured pretty prominently in the last pay-per-view. One of them was in the main event of the show, the last match that went on for like 50 minutes. Now he, they're wrestling Breeze Dongo. So the first match of the night was The Shield, and they defeated New Day. And this was a pretty good match. And I'm going to say that a lot throughout this show, because there was a lot of these matches that were really good. The only problem is... A lot of them were uneventful, and I'm going to get to that mostly in the main event when we talk about exactly why this show was, was uneventful, why it wasn't an amazing show. It was a good show, 
You know, don't let anybody tell you that it was a bad show because it was enjoyable. You know what you're going to get on a pay-per-view. You know you're going to get a, a majority of wrestling. Um, the entertainment factor will take a, a, you know, a backseat as far as promos go. You'll get your promos. But, you know, things usually happen at pay-per-views that affect the landscape of the product. That didn't really happen tonight. But anyway, the Shield defeated New Day. They went back and forth. Um, as far as what Wade Keller said, that it looked like New Day belonged in the ring with the Shield, not exactly. And I couldn't still help but feel that Roman Reigns is in the opening match and he has every right to be in that main event match. I mean, I know he was there last year, but I, I seriously, I can't help but feel that the guy should be in the main event match that they're talking about an all-star lineup on the Raw side. And meanwhile, you've got Fat Boy Samoa Joe and Fuck Boy Balor there, but no, no Roman Reigns? You know, well, Brad, but he's in the Shield. I know that! I know he's in the Shield. I know that, you know, they wanted to give the fans what they wanted. You know, they wanted the Shield and everything. Okay, well, now we've had two matches. They beat New Day. Where else are we going to go with this? It's time for these guys to go their separate ways again and have Roman Reigns go back to pissing everybody off because I think it's great. All right? You know, something I say this time and time again. The more you guys hate on Roman Reigns, the more you give him a tough time, and the more I see the guy improving every single day that he's out there, I like him more and more. Do I do I think that they should turn him heel? They probably should. Uh, do I think that they should probably at least make him an anti-hero of some sort? Yes, and they were working their way towards that with John Cena. But I just can't help but feel that he's in the ring with John Cena one week, and then another, and then several weeks later, a couple of months later, he finds himself in the ring with Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods. Like, come on. You know, if anything, besides Big E, they should have killed that fucking team, really. It shouldn't have went on as long as it did. Um... Then Stephanie was riling the troops up backstage. You know, I'm sick and tired of hearing Stephanie scream. And Michael Cole, what a leader. What a fucking headache is all I can say. Okay, you know, I had the idea three years ago. Remember when Stephanie was in the match with uh, Brie Bella? I said maybe Stephanie shouldn't be like the main person on the show but they should maybe make her like a GM or, you know, the head of the Divas division or the women's division. And I said that that might be a good role for her. Well, after hearing this, if we had to sit through that every night of her screaming at them, Alicia, take her out there! And ah, it's the same thing every night, shut up! She's trying to be like McMahon, but McMahon never, you know, screamed and yelled every single minute. Was the guy a little bit loud? You know, did he get aggressive at times? Yes, but not every single goddamn promo. Every single promo she's yelling and screaming at somebody's face. Uh, you know, she went to all five girls and basically fucking blew their eardrums out it, it just in, in a matter of two minutes. I, I mean, what... Uh, you know, what What can be accomplished from this besides everybody just, you know, muting the TV so they don't have to listen to this bitch's fucking huge ass mouth every single fucking time she appears? So, yeah, if I knew that this is how she would act if, you know, they ever put her in that position of being in the head of the Divas division, I would have never suggested that years ago. Uh, so it was t the team uh, Raw for the Divas, the women, beat the SmackDown side. Um, and they missed a huge opportunity here. A big opportunity here. And, you know, guys, I, I just have to say something. Because I'm going to pretty much rant a little bit about how they handled Nia Jax in this match. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about how great Nia Jax's ass looked in those pants. There was like one moment 
when she was like in the ring there with um what's her name? With Snooka's daughter. Um Tamina, there you go. I couldn't get my eyes off of it. I'm just saying. But anyway, so she gets eliminated. Uh Nia Jax gets counted out. You know, Tamina keeps hitting her with moves and she can't get back in the ring. And then she just like looks at the ring and walks away and doesn't return. Was I not the only one who thought that she should have got back in that ring and destroyed everybody out of anger? Not only destroyed the SmackDown side, but destroyed the Raw side as well, just out of sheer anger. I, I, you know, I want her to be booked like Awesome Kong. I'm just saying she's prettier than Awesome Kong. She has quite the ass, you know, or maybe it was just those pants I was looking at him in, but, I, you know, I'm just saying it, 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 it may be harder to take her as a, you know, one, one of the toughest women, but she's, you know, she's big and she looks dominant and she could be dominant. And she does have that look to her, like she should be kicking ass. And, you know, the fact that she's in the ring with Tamina and the announcers are like, Oh, you know, and I thought this was a good idea for a match. I thought this was a good idea for a feud. But this would be more exciting if they actually build these girls up and they actually made an effort here. Made an effort. So when they did get in the ring together, it wasn't just like, oh, okay, well, here's the two big girls that always lose all the time. Tamina has not even been featured on TV. They gave her, like, two wins, and then they, like, made her lose a match. And, and Nia Jax has been, like, up and down, and she still hasn't won a women's title. You know, the fact that, like, every single woman right now, like, that was in this ring has won a women's title, you know, besides Carmella, I think, that's pretty sad that Nia Jax and Tamina, the two that actually look like the biggest badasses, haven't won any titles. No, no women's championship on Raw or SmackDown. And that shouldn't be. I mean, you've got two girls that look like viable contenders, viable champions. So when these two girls get in the ring together, it should be like, oh, man, this is, you know. And I was like, yeah, I want to see them go head to head. But it would have been better if they tagged in and you knew that these girls had kicked ass in their previous divisions, but they haven't really kicked ass. They've been like, ah, they've won some, they've lost some. And that, like I said, that is a, a creative mishap right there. There's no excuse why girls that look like these two girls shouldn't be at the top. You know, it, it, and I notice they always do that. So they don't want to build people up. And then when it's convenient for them, they tell a whole different story on commentary. Like they've been dominating. Like we haven't been watching the show. Like we haven't been following along. That's why it's so inconsistent. You, you know, this is why it's so important to build people accordingly. Because if you want to tell a certain story on commentary that, you know, these are such dominant women, they shouldn't be losing all the time. Backstage, Stephanie was with Daniel Bryan. She says that if, you know, something happens to Shane, Daniel Bryan is, is going to have to take control of the show. Um, this was pretty tame. I thought that Stephanie was going to get more aggressive with Daniel Bryan, you know, considering, you know, he brought up the fact that he beat Triple H at Mania, that he beat the Authority at Mania. Um, Stephanie said that that's going to be the only time that happens. Baron Corbin defeated The Miz. This was a big surprise, and that's probably what it was supposed to be. You know, I thought it was funny. The whole buildup for this match, they couldn't even show anything in ring or anything that actually took place on the show. Because I've been mentioning it. You have the IC champ and the US champ. And they've spent a lot of time trying to put prestige back into these belts. And maybe that might be one of the upsides of the show. At least the Miz has held the title for a while. They've made it pretty prominent for Miz. Like it's a, you know, a set piece for him that he's the IC champ. And he's been reigning for so long. Uh, but they didn't even take the effort... To feud at all. Baron Corbin and Miz are trading shots on on the fucking internet. Not just on the internet, is it on WWE.com? No, it's on Twitter. They're trading back. What about people who don't watch Twitter? 
So they talk about, you know, a pretty broad scope of people that like to watch this show. And remember, like, I remember people even commented. It was a bit surprising that some people that are a bit older, you know, who probably are not more inclined to use social media actually watch the show. So that's raw. I don't know if it applies to the network, but whatever. There's obviously people who don't bother with the WWE on Twitter. They might be on Twitter, but they might not follow wrestlers, you know, and and wrestling companies. You know, they might be too busy following other entertainers or following hot women on there, you know, or just doing personal stuff with friends. You know, WWE likes to assume, oh, everybody's on Twitter. Social media is very popular, so we're just going to put this shit on there. No. That, that's not how it works. You actually have to make an effort. You should be putting these guys on the show, and they should be performing this stuff on the show for people to see for a wider audience. You couldn't spare at least five, seven, eight minutes. Instead of doing those retarded Breeze Dongo segments with James Ellsworth's dirty underwear in a fucking briefcase, you couldn't take that seven or eight minutes and apply it to a the, you know your intercontinental versus U.S. champ match. Couldn't do that, huh? Couldn't spare a couple of minutes for that. I guess not. How much worse can the booking get when these guys haven't even touched each other before the pay per view, haven't even interacted on a WWE program? You, you know, they're, okay, they're airing it now. And, you know, they're, they're making... I will give WWE credit for this. When it comes to making video packages, they are good at actually making it look like a feud is good, combining it with the music, put, editing it together very expertly. And they kind of did that here a bit. And, you know, they really have to be experts if they could get a whole thing at, out of just Twitter. So... I don't know, but I, I thought that it would have made for good TV, especially Baron Corbin. Um, you know, I, I don't get this. Baron Corbin's comment also, Miz's reaction is like he says, don't talk about my wife or I'll kick your effing teeth down your throat. When Baron Corbin said you should go home and play dress up with your pregnant wife. And it's like, is that even really an insult? Like, should the Miz, like, think about that in the proper context of what he said. He didn't say anything disparaging about Maurice. Didn't call her ugly. Didn't insult her. Didn't say like she needs a real man or anything like that. Didn't say anything like that. And the Miz was like offended, you know, about what he said to his wife. But 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 what did he say about his wife? He said that he should go home and play dress up. So it's like this is what I'm saying. They make like the wrestlers are always getting offended by insults, and these writers are horrible at writing insults. They never, you you know, it really is. Like, what they say as insults would not get normal. More normal people in everyday life would laugh if those were the insults that people were trading back and forth. You know, nobody would be intimidated by one another or be getting angry if that was the case. So Corbin beats Miz. Uh, Charlie's backstage. And I got to tell you, there's something very weird about this girl, Charlie. She is like, remember she got caught one week acting like a robot? Remember like with her eyes wide? Now, this, Charlie is a pretty attractive girl. But there's something about her style when she's like this. And I, I don't know, it's kind of like how she talks. And I, I don't know, but I'm always like, whoa. Remember I talked about it, like it seems almost like she's being bitchy? Well, that's kind of how it was again. It's very strange how they have this girl act. Like, I don't know. It's almost like she's synthetic. Like, she's not real. Like, she's not really there. Because I'm always watching her, and she's... I don't know. There's very something very off about her. Anyway, it's Paul Heyman cutting another promo. AJ Styles going to be ripped apart by the Beast. But can this guy seriously get off the same broken record? I am sick and tired of hearing the same promo time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. And why so many times? Because that's really how, like, it's like a hundred more times. 
Ever since Heyman and Paul uh, and Brock Lesnar have reunited in 2012, it's been the same story. Night after night that he appears. Heyman is doing the sell job like he's a fucking piece of furniture, like he's a, a, a car of some sort. Hawking him like a used car salesman. Every single night, and I'm saying switch it up, give Brock the mic. Do something different. You don't have to have Heyman out there. We know who Brock is. Most people who watch this product, hell, you only have your niche audience, so half the people watching this already know. We already heard it on Raw. Do we really need to hear it again on the pay-per-view, even though it's in a shorter, more condensed version? No, we're, we're good. We don't need to hear it again. We just heard it. We don't need to hear it again. Um... The Usos defeated Sheamus and Cesaro. Uh, you know, again, like a, a really long match. Like, this is the thing. They wanted to make sure these matches were even, so they made sure these matches were really long, you know, and hard fought out battles and shit. But the thing is, it's like enough is enough already. I will take a 10 minute match, honestly. You know, it, it, there's a little something called overkill, and this is what it was. Um, you know, they didn't go, like, so overboard with the finishers. I will say that tonight. They kind of kept it to a bit of a calm, you know, like, not, not as, like, crazy as, like, kicking out of every single thing. Um, so, they, I mean, it was a good match, but I'm saying they, they, these matches are, like, ridiculous in length. Every single one of them is, like, 15, 20 minutes. Jason Jordan was backstage. And, well, I'm going to get to this later on. So, Jason Jordan says, you know, that um, he wants to see team, team Raw win, but he wouldn't mind seeing Triple H get eliminated. Um, so, keep that in mind. Jason Jordan's back there talking about Triple H, hoping that he meets with some misfortune during the match. Charlotte defeated Alexa Bliss. Bliss controlled, like, almost the whole match. Then Charlotte came out with the big boot. Beat her with the figure eight. Um, it, you know, it, it was a decent match. You know, I, I couldn't help but feel that I thought it was going to be better. Can you know, these are like my my two favorite women on the. So that I was happy that it wasn't Natalia in here that they put Charlotte. So it was like the two best women, the two best on the mic. Also, you know, the only other one is like Carmella who can really match them on the mic. But de you know, decent enough. Um, you know, I guess they wanted to make, like, Alexa that dominated the whole thing and Charlotte just made a little comeback at the end so they can make her look strong. And I will give them that. I mean, they did good, do a good job of trying to protect these people. Uh, you know, but I couldn't help but feel the thing is that they didn't build these matches up. So kind of like, you know, you would have cared a little bit more who won and lost. I don't, it was kind of like Alexa was but like, eh, you know, okay, so, you know, she dominated the whole match, and I guess that's the whole point. But, you know, one shot to the face on SmackDown, and that was it. That was the only interaction that these girls had. Because most of the time she was building up towards facing Natalia, they switched it at the last minute, and the buildup went out the window. The, the only buildup they really had. Uh, so you had, uh, Brock Lesnar and AJ Styles up next. So Brock tore through AJ. AJ made a couple of comebacks. He, he hit a couple of phenomenal forearms. Um, so he springboarded for the next forearm. Brock caught him, hit the F5. They booked this match very well, I will say that. And, and, and I said, I wonder how they would have booked the gender match if they went uh, through with that one. But having Brock, like, be tired throughout the match because his endurance wasn't as good, I don't really get why his endurance wouldn't be as good considering how fast Brock is and that he's trained for the UFC and he's trained for endurance, I guess, because he weighs more. That's probably the thing. But, all right, so they told the story pretty well that AJ is the endurance guy. 
that he survived Brock Lesnar up to a certain point, managed to make a comeback. But they did a decent job of making this match realistic, or as realistic as it possibly could have looked. My whole point, and people weren't happy with me saying this, is that, you know, Jinder and Brock Lesnar side by side looked like a, you know, a more viable, believable match than AJ and Brock. And that's all I'm saying. And, and really, I would come out and say it. I mean, if I really had to say who is the better wrestler, it is AJ Styles. Who do I like better overall? It is AJ Styles. But if I'm booking this pay-per-view and I'm booking creatively uh, and I'm the writer or whatever, whoever I, I am, I'm placing in in the role what I, I do. Uh, and people would ask me what would I do if Vince McMahon gave me his battle. So th this is the thing. I wouldn't really look at, you know, what match would be five stars and would make Meltzer Magoo cream his pants. I'd be looking at more like, okay, well, what's a match that's more believable that people could get into more from a storyline perspective? And what, what match is more sellable? Like, that's easier for the announcers to get over as like a match that's, you know, going to have a lot of uh, action and ass kicking. And something that, you know, seems like more of a selling point. I'd say the two muscle men. You know, AJ Styles got a good build and everything, but the guy is short. And he doesn't even weigh anything close to Brock Lesnar. And side by side, Brock Lesnar looked like he could kill him. And he was killing him through most of the match. And thank God he did that. Because if it was even Stevens throughout the match, I would have fucking said it was a bad match. I would have, because... That would have been the truth. You can't have me sit there watching a guy that looks like Brock Lesnar get dominated by AJ. That didn't happen, so I was pretty happy with the way the match turned out. And then in the main event, it was Team Raw defeating Team SmackDown, as I predicted. So, you know, seeing Naka Murphy in there with Triple H and how excited the Marks got, this was pretty. This was a pretty marky crowd, I will say, for for Texas. It's kind of strange, you know. You kind of would say that the Midwest, the South, are, is not as marky. That's more for like the Northeast, you know, like over here, in New York and shit, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You would expect like the fans to be more smarky, more marky, more annoying, more obnoxious. So. You know, they, they were demanding that Randy Orton tag in Naka Murphy to go one-on-one -on -one with the fuck boy. And that happened. And I'm watching this match. I'm seeing Randy Orton, John Cena, Triple H, Kurt Angle, Braun Strowman. And then I'm watching a man rub his nose on another man's abdomen. And I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, look at Naka Murphy's face. I know you could say, like, oh, well, it gives him character. I don't know. He looks like a fucking retard. Naka Murphy, shitcake Naka Murphy looks like a retard. Let, let's just, no bones about it. Let's just get right down to it and say it. Guy looks like a retard. Looks like he's got problems. He looks stupid. He looks dumb. I don't like his mannerisms. I don't like anything about the guy. So I, I don't understand. Like, no one can still tell me. What's so great about Naka Murphy? Why should I cream my pants over Naka Murphy? Why should I be praising Naka Murphy in my videos? Why should I be a big time fan of Naka Murphy? What is it about him that's so great? And I can't, I still can't figure it out. Uh, besides the fact that he's from Japan, and it's cool to like people from Japan. Sorry, I'm not Meltzer Magoo. Sorry, I'm not a, a smart that watches 10 hours of Japanese wrestling a day. Sorry. Sorry about that. Not happening. Um, so, so this is what happens during the match. So, you know, it, it was a good match. Um, you know, we, I, I liked, we had Kurt Angle in there, Triple H. We had Strowman. Uh, and, you know, and... and it was a good match. So the thing is, they get down to the end. And we're faced with Kurt Angle, Triple H, and um, 
Carry on Triple H and Braun Strowman. They're all there. And Shane McMahon's left. They eliminated Randy Orton. So the match has been pretty good. They put Strowman through a table at one part. Um, Fuckboy Balor got eliminated with an RKO, which was good. Um, so, you know, and I liked seeing John Cena just F you the shit out of the fat boy. And then uh, Fuckboy, and, you know, he went back and forth with that. So, my issue with this match is the ending. So, Shane McMahon has to get out of this situation. I was like, this is the part where I thought we were in for something big. Shane McMahon's there all alone. Triple H, Kurt Angle, Braun Strowman. Obviously, he can't believably beat, like, Braun Strowman. Even if he somehow managed to beat Triple H or Kurt Angle, I'm like, this is not happening. He's not winning this match. Unless, I mean, there's a disqualification in this match. But I said, like, maybe something will happen. Someone's going to help Shane McMahon. Someone's going to bail him out of this situation. Is it Jason Jordan? No. Jason Jordan wasn't anywhere to be found. Was it somebody else, a returning wrestler of some sort? Was somebody going to make a triumphant return and maybe help Shane McMahon out? No, that didn't happen either. Um, so I was like, so what's going to happen? So Kurt Angle, Braun Strowman, Triple H are all like tagging each other in. They want to be the one to finish off Shane McMahon. So Kurt Angle's the last one to tag in. Hits the angle slam on, um, on Shane McMahon. So Triple H comes in. Pedigrees Kurt Angle uh, very sloppily, I might add. I don't know what happened there. Um, so he, he hits the pedigree on Kurt Angle. And then Triple H puts Shane McMahon on top of Kurt Angle. And I'm like, swerve! So is, you know, is this going to be some type of new corporation? Is the authority back? Is, you know, what, what, what's going on here? Shane McMahon is turning heel? I mean, he was being a bit heelish, so, I mean, you know, during the SmackDown versus Raw thing, so now they're going to put him to the next level. Is Shane going to be, like, the next Vince McMahon? Lots of thoughts ran through my head at this point. And then Triple H, I was like, okay, so now that his dad just got pedigreed and everything, Jason Jordan's going to come out. Still no Jason Jordan. Still nobody. Is there going to be something with Strowman? Strowman stays on the ring apron. Then Triple H picks up Shane McMahon. He's looking at Strowman, looks at Strowman, looks at Shane. Then he pedigrees Shane and pins him, and then it's it. And then, Kurt, and then Michael Cole's reaction. Oh, so that's what it was about. He, you know, he, he just wanted to be the one to finish off Shane McMahon. You had a prime opportunity there to do something interesting. You you were doing something interesting. You you were you were doing it. You were on the cusp of doing it. You sort of did it, and then you were like, "And uh, you know what? We're not going to really do anything with this." So you had a chance there to do something interesting with Kurt Angle and Triple H. They'll probably stand up, uh, end up in a feud, maybe. Maybe they will have that WrestleMania match or whatever because Triple H did indeed pedigree Kurt Angle. But what a stupid thing that was at the end. I, I, I mean, it, it was like they wanted to do a swerve, but then they didn't want to commit themselves to the swerve. So they just said, oh, you know what, they gave some lame excuse like it. It was just because it was just because Triple H wanted to finish off Shane, not because we wanted to do something elaborate and interesting that would maybe make people, you know, actually wake up and actually see something, you know, different. Uh, a new storyline could have been born. Something interesting could have happened that hasn't happened in years. You know, we we could have had it like a new year or something could have happened. I I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm overblowing it. Maybe you know, I'm just saying that. It looked like that was the spot where something really interesting was going to happen. Something unforgettable was going to happen. Something that we would have been talking about for weeks. 
but instead they just kind of bailed out of it. Like, obviously they knew what they were going to do, but it was like a fake swerve. And it really fucking pissed me off. I'll just say that. I was like, you had an opportunity right there. Triple H is part of Team Raw. He just screwed Kurt Angle. But it wasn't really a screw job because Triple H ended up winning the match for his team anyway. So Triple H is raising Braun Strowman's hand. Then Strowman starts choking out Triple H and says, you know, don't you ever play around like that again. Triple H attacked him from behind. And Strowman planted him with the running power slam. You know, okay, so that was a little extra something at the end, but compared to what they could have done in that Shane McMahon situation, they could have debuted a new star, even if it led to a disqualification because Shane was going to lose anyway. It's, you know, I don't know. Why did you, why did they book it that way, is all I have to say. Is that where they left Shane alone, and then they they wanted they made and teased like something interesting was going to happen, and then probably the most disinteresting ha thing happened in the same breath. I don't get it. I will never understand WWE why they do things like this. You could keep saying it's because they don't give a shit. You could I, you could, we've come up with theories here in the YWC for a very long time, and it, I guess it is just that they don't give a shit. They don't care. They don't know what they're doing. They're incompetent. McMahon's too old. I don't know what it is. But all I'm saying is right there in that spot, that was prime time, baby. There was something that could have happened there that could have changed the landscape, could have sparked some interest in the product. And then they, they just kind of threw their hands up and said, you know what, we're just going to fake people out instead and then just go on to the next night of just boring matches and promos. So... There you go, guys. There's your there's your Survivor Series review. I mean, it was a good show. There was enjoyable matches. There was some good wrestling on there. I like the start studdedness of the match. Um, one thing that I could not believe is that that uh, John Cena got pinned off of a crew de gras. I mean, he got hit by another move prior to that. I forgot what it was. Um, but he ended up getting pinned. So anyway, um, you know, there you go, guys. There is your Survivor Series review. Uh, and all I'm saying, guys, is there was a chance there for something really good to happen at the end. Instead, it was just a bland way to end the match. Anyway, guys, there you go. This has been your YWC champ. Signing out.